sensitivity two, three, four. This information is coming from chapters 15 and 16 together. And uh, again, the role of antibodies, role of cells, whether it be allergy, whether it be response to infection, response to cancer, transplantation, we pretty much are talking about same humoral and cell mediated immunity and the same players are there. Now, in this part, I would want you to pay attention that what type of antibodies are there and as you would have expected that uh, IgG and IgM are the major players in this type of hypersensitivity reactions. Though uh, in some cases we do see IgA or IgE as well but if I was to ask you the major uh, antibody in type 1 of course that was IgE. And as I said earlier, uh, there are some subtle differences between type 2 and 3 and a lot of overlap and students struggle with that. So uh, and I personally think that your book did a good job of uh, differentiating them. And basically, uh, they are differentiated by the type of antigen involved. That's number one. And also, we want to find out where is that particular antigen located. And third part will be how do this antigen and antibody talk to each other. And it's been a common theme that I said that B cell talk to T cell, T cell talk to antigen presenting cell. So like, likewise antigen talk to antibodies. Now, uh, the common themes for, for both uh, type Two and type three hypersensitivity is that uh, in this case the antigen is on the surface of the cell and the whole process basically is stimulated when an antibody comes and binds to the antigen so the antigen of course is, will be sitting on the surface of the cell and that's where the initial contact takes place and then again uh, this will lead to an antigen antibody immune complex and in most of the cases that you see in type 2 and 3 uh, the target antigens the target antigens are self antigens so again uh, if your body's own protective immune response like IgM and IgD antibodies pick up you uh, to do the damage so that's not a good thing uh, for them to do. But eventually, many autoimmune diseases will have that kind of hypersensitivity reaction. So let's take uh, two in detail to begin with. And we'll also talk uh, about the damage. Remember when things go out of control, when things are not properly orchestrated, organized, regulated, so immune system will end up damaging you. And we want to come and help you out, but we need to know what, how and how to do that. We have to understand the mechanism of damage. When I say damage, basically I'm talking about the tissue death. So there is a tissue cell damage. So there's a damage taking place in the tissue and that's what we see. And if that particular tissue is from an organ that is vital like kidney, joints, so on and so forth, so you would see an appropriate uh, clinical symptoms and clinical features of that disease. So if you pay attention to type 2 hypersensitivity reactions, so these are the common mechanisms that type 2 hypersensitivity damage their target. So the targets are damaged. And in this case, as we discussed in the complement uh, lecture as well, many of the things are coming from complement mediated damage so the complement is going to go and help antibodies to get attached to those particular tissues uh, the other thing is that when antibody and cell come together to cause a damage we call that uh, initially antibody mediated 
or antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. So ADCC is a typical term and I will discuss that in detail today. And then of course uh, antibodies can attach to uh, some of the receptors on your body and make those receptors dysfunctional and then again would lead to problems as we discussed in uh, acetylcholine receptors. Now let's talk of uh, complement uh, mediated reactions and those of you who were there in that lecture uh, the whole idea was that uh, there are antigens on the self uh, on the cell membrane of your own self. Remember complement is good to take care of uh, foreign invaders like bacteria but this time what happens is that the antibodies react with the cell membrane self antigens that is not what they're supposed to do but that's what they do and that would lead to a complement factor cascade as we discussed the other day there's a cascade from C1 to C9 and we discussed that in detail in chapter 13 and those of you who want to go and look it up and look listen to the podcast as well eventually you will get lysis of the cells so you got cell lysis now uh, what may happen is that many a times the antibodies uh, will again attach to self antigen that's a key word here and then will cause the optionization of the target cell so whatever target cell is there they will coat it up and then make them presentable or palatable or eatable for phagocytes. And these phagocytes, basically, the big eaters are macrophages and polymorphonuclear uh, neutrophils. So they are there, and, and sometimes they can even uh, pick up antigens on the blood cells. So if blood cells have an antigen, like red blood cells, and these antigens are going to be opsonized by the complement, and the phagocytes will come and they will chew up and take in your own red blood cell and then you will have anemias. Okay. The interested experiment that was done to signify uh, where is this mechanism coming from. So if you remember IgG has a FC receptor and many a time IgG is involved. If you were to prepare genetically prepared mice, that's what we normally do. And if we take out that particular gene, as we've been saying, VDJ uh, segment joining of that particular sequence of gene, and knock out FC portion of IgG in this mice, so this mice will never develop type 2 and type 3 type hypersensitivities. So this experiment will tell you of course, uh, the direct relationship of IgG FC portion and why I'm saying FC portion because FC portion is what's going to attach those part particular cells and that's where the damage will begin. Okay, but again, that may not be easy for, uh, for the human uh, experiments. So you want to knock out a human gene, but uh, it does prove a point that FC portion of IgG is involved. Now, if you look at this picture, again, it gives you an idea at what's still happening, the complement mediated reaction, and it was going to end up into lysis, cell death. Okay, now these are the sequence of events, and why do we know, need to know the sequence of events? Because we want to come up with a way to stop that happening. Now, this is a target cell, and your antibodies come and attach to these target cells, right? And not only that, uh, complement receptors also come and attach to them. And remember, there were two important features that we discussed for the complement receptors was, one was that uh, MAC, if you remember then, membrane attack complex, which involved all those C1 to C9 and if you remember what was the mechanism of damage of MAC does anybody remember what is the mechanism of damage to the cell lysis correct 
So what they used to do was they used to poke a hole into the cell and disturb the water and ion concentration. It's like an osmotic disbalance. And then you can see that happening. The membrane attack, attack complex pokes hole over here, right? And then there is osmotic lysis. So that happens for uh, one of the mechanisms. The other one was that you have a C3B, which is an opsonin. It will attach to the opsonin complement binding sites of antibodies. And you see, if you look at the structure of an antibody, many antibodies have a complement binding site at FC portion. And that's what you see on FC portion. And this will then help to be easily phagocytosed. Okay, if it happens to be, let's, let's say, red blood cell, and your own antibody recognize your own red blood cell antigen, so these red cells will be phagocytosed by your own macrophages, and you will lose your red cells, and you'll have anemia, loss of red blood cells. Or, I get, just give an example, that some of the cells like macrophages have an FC receptor. So there's an FC receptor there, and again, uh, this FC receptor will bind the antibodies over here, and the same process will continue, and the, there will be increased phagocytosis. So this is what we say that a complement-mediated uh, reaction that would lead to lysis of any cell. Okay. And then again, uh, one important other receptor that we talked about in complement was C3B receptor. It was one of the complement receptors that we discussed earlier. So in second type of type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, we see antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. And again, you will see antibodies will come, identify those antigens, they could be self-antigens and bind to them. So that is the initiation of this type of reaction. And then again, you have natural killer cell, macrophages, neutrophils, and eosinophils. So these are the bunch of cells which eventually will come in and attach to those antibodies, and then they will lead to cytotoxicity. And the way they do it, that they have a FC portion. There is a FC portion which is required. So you have to have that FC portion. And also remember the FC portion, especially for IgG. Uh, does anybody remember what was the name of that particular receptor uh, that was expressed on mast cells to attach IgE antibodies we discussed yesterday? IgE epsilon receptor 1, that's what I said. You know, that was an important receptor that was expressed. In this case, you can see IgG has another epsilon receptor, which is uh, FC receptor epsilon 3. So that's one of the important receptors that we have a type 2. And then we have an IgE FC epsilon receptor 2. One was for type 1. And this is for type 2. So if you ask this question, which one is going to fall in type 1 or file type 2? FC epsilon R1 is for type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. And there are some drugs targeted towards that. And type 2 basically is for type 2 hypersensitivity. So the other important thing is that uh, in this case, uh, uh, for cell lysis to occur, for in immunological terms, if there is a killing of cell, so that killing comes with the direct contact. So the cells have to come in contact with each other before they are. So it's a cell-cell interaction. This is a contact lysis. And that's a typical of uh, T cells. So T cells also, especially cytotoxic T cells have this capability that they will come and attach. And what normally happens is that when these cells come in contact of, with the target cell, uh, they release cytoplasmic granules. So these are some specific granules 
they are like bullets pumped into the cell and they are called foreign and grand zymes. And if you look at the chemical biochemical structures, they are uh, serine proteases. They are serine proteases. And then again, we have perforin especially, they will insert and polymerize and form pores over here. And we have grand zymes, they will basically enter the cytoplasm and activate apoptosis. So if you think that cell lysis in this case is occurring uh, via apoptosis, so my question to you will be, would this apoptosis lead to inflammation or not? No. Good. Because apoptosis basically is a programmed cell that, that normally happens to remove unwanted cells from a body. And the difference between necrosis and apoptosis is many times we have necrosis with inflammation and apoptosis normally would be without inflammation. So that's kind of a normal process. But again, you can see that this may happen. Uh, again, uh, antibody mediated. Uh, so IgG comes, is a target cell and coats that particular antigen. And then again, there is an FC receptor that we just mentioned, FC epsilon R2. And these receptors are present on NK cell. And then this NK cell will use perforins or granzymes. So these are specific killing mechanisms that they will either poke holes and uh, osmotic lysis or they will uh, initiate some of the events that would lead to apoptosis. But the question will come that this is of course not good for cells to lyse, but we can use the same mechanism to work out our therapy or to work out some of the drugs that we may need to use in cancer. So we can use the same killing machinery, the same concept, which is already there as a part of our body to go against. And that's what the body does when it needs to fight with the, the different microorganisms. Okay. And then again, you can see uh, there is a, in this case, this is a T cell apoptosis. So they can, uh, if, if it happens to be a T cell, that's why it's a target cell. It could be any cell. Depending, the whole idea is that your antibodies are picking up your own cell epitopes as foreign. And then they will go after them and will attach to them and initiate the whole event. The third important part of type 2 hypersensitivity reaction is that we have these antibodies and they bind to the cell surface receptors. And when they bind to those receptors, of course, they are going to impair the normal functions of uh, those receptors. And then uh, there will be dysregulation. Again, this type of activity uh, may not invite inflammatory cells. And there may not be an obvious injury. So there may not be an obvious injury. But uh, a typical example, as we gave before, as with acetylcholine receptors. So you can see uh, there are motor end plates, acetylcholine being released, and this is a synaptic cleft, and you have acetylcholine receptor on the other end of the membrane. So normally acetylcholine would come and attach to them. In this case, what happened is since acetylcholine receptor is a protein, so your body develops antibodies to that particular receptors. Right? So you have a antibody for acetylcholine receptor. So this will come and bind it. So the availability of this receptor will be lost. And then again, there would be impaired neuromuscular junction transmission. And this is a disease called myasthenia gravis. And uh, the patients that we have seen in myasthenia gravis, I mean, it may look very simple to you, but uh, you need an action potential uh, generated in your eyelids to lift up your eyes. That's what it is. So these patients will have droopings of eyelid. So if they want to see, they will have to lift their eyelids like that to see. And you can't hold it like that. So you may have to do something. So things of even that nature happen in myasthenia gravis patients. And so on and so forth. Okay. So you can see from here, uh, type 2 hypersensitivity 
that the antibodies like IgG, very powerful antibody with complement fixation ability, and uh, with the 80% of your uh, uh, total immunoglobulins are IgGs. It's a big antibody with a lot of functions, with a lot of antibacterial, antitoxin uh, activity, and the only antibody to pass through placenta. So very important antibody. If that is going to go after your own cells, may it be red blood cell, may it be tissues, may it be, uh, in this case, your receptors, then we are in trouble. Okay? And this is like a summary slide for all three mechanisms. Complement mediated, antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity, and anti-receptor antibodies. They all will lead to a reaction which is called type 2 hypersensitivity reactions. So what are the clinical examples? Let me give you some of the clinical examples without going in much detail. Uh, transfusion reactions. This is very common. And uh, I did ask this question to the lab the other day. So you did the lab one, right? So the, the antigens present on your, if you are type A, this means the A antigens are present on your red blood cells. And then the antibody you will have will be B. You cannot have that. Now, my question uh, the other day was that what type of antigen, you know, antigen come as protein, lipids, you know, carbohydrates, nucleic acid. So what type of antigen is present on the red blood cell? This ABO blood group, what type of antigen is this? How many, raise hands, how many of you think proteins? Okay, how many of you think carbohydrates? They are carbohydrates. They are carbohydrates. These are carbohydrates. But the question will, then you will think that, why do we have such a severe transfusion reaction? The transfusion reaction you have is not because of ABO blood groups, it's because of rhesus. So what type of antigen is rhesus? Protein. So rhesus antigen is a protein that's why it's more important for me to know what is your rhesus blood group than your ABO blood group. You will have some reaction, but the reaction that you will have will be transfusion reaction uh, for carbohydrates. And you know carbohydrates are immunogenic, but not that fatal. But they can also pair up with proteins and cause them. So this is keep in mind in terms of that. And that's why you see over here drug-induced reactions, if that happens, rhesus incompatibility, Reactions involving cell membrane, myasthenia gravis, and then some other diseases where you see idiop idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, ITP, Goodpaster syndrome, pemphis vulgaris, very nasty conditions that you see, very difficult to treat, and they have a tissue injury, and many of them are still being discussed. But you can see all these clinical pictures represent type 2 hypersensitivity reactions. So if there's a mismatch, if I ask you, if there's a mismatch blood transfusion, that is not type 1. That is not allergy. It is type 2. Right? So far so good? Okay. So let's talk about type T hypersensitivity reaction. Now, if you were to compare them, and you should compare it, and because I'm just following a sequence uh, of the book so that uh, your, your book reading experience is easy on you, and uh, I'll pick up slides uh, from our clinical chapters when I present it in a workshop. But you can see from here uh, the damage which was being caused in type 2 was more or less when the antigen was fixed. Whether it be on red blood cell or T cell or uh, acetylcholine receptors in the neuromuscular junction. Type 3, most of the time, then again, most of the time, where you have circulating immune complexes. So which one do you think is going to cause more problem? Type 2 or type 3? Why? Who said 3? Why? Yeah, correct. Because the thing is, that will be local damage, and this one is circulating in the whole blood, so you can have multiple organs involved. Many a time you see these type of reactions, on skin. So you see skin rashes and all these kind of different things that you may come across. 
So in this case again, uh, phagocytosis by the FC segments and then again uh, red blood cell basically have a, a complement fixation. So red blood cell have another capability that they can be uh, fixed by C3B. C3B is an opsonin. So this opsonin complement attaches to the red blood cell and then they are receptors, I receptors. And as a matter of fact, I look at some of the questions that you were asking on your podcast. And some of the questions many are asking were just giving me this information that you do not listen to the podcast carefully because answers were already there. And I said to myself, how on earth you come up with this question after going through that? So th some of you probably thought that it's just a matter of writing question for the sake of question. Well, it wasn't like that. So if you uh, speak up, it shows you what's happening in your mind. But anyway, uh, keep in mind that uh, there are antigen-presenting cells. We talked about dendritic cell, and then we talked about uh, macrophages and monocyte. Let me come up with another. So as we move along, we're going to confuse you. That what it starts very easy. So as we move along, it gets confusing, but that's the way it is. So that's why basically uh, they don't want to give a diagnosis to pharmacists. They want to leave it to physicians to take care of that. So they take the blame and they take the pay as well. So anyway, when things get confusing is that the antigen presenting cells may be sitting locally, like Langerhansen in the skin, like Kufer cells in, in the liver, like many other cells which are there in these tissues and they are on surveillance. Right? So they can, they are used to looking at the abnormal cells. So they can pick up, they can do the work. Okay? Now, one important thing that I'm going to dis discuss today is that it's called histidine rich glycoprotein, which is uh, synthesized by the liver and is released in the blood, and that basically uh, will take care of apoptotic cells. Because you wonder, well, if programmed cell is normal, cells are dying, but ap apoptosis, what is the fate of that cell? Where are that cell going? It's not like digestion, so you absorb what is required and the waste is secreted, right, as a fecal matter. But in this case, there is a, uh, this, a garbage there. There is something over there, and that needs to be removed. So we are looking at histidine rich glycoprotein, okay? Now, if you compare that uh, for uh, HRG, the whole idea is that many a time you need a pre-activation. Sometimes, remember we talked about uh, in mast cell that they are already vesicles there to begin with. And some of the vesicles are their de novo synthesis. They are done after the activation. Now, if you compare this uh, HRG, basically it does not require pre-activation. So it's already there. So this is a good mechanism for uh, our cells to remove those apoptotic cells because apoptotic cells will clog the system, damage the system, and there are too much of things going on. Okay, let's see in clinical example in terms of type 2, type 3 immune complexes. So you can see number one is that uh, you have an antigen in circulation, and then you have an antibody over there that form antigen-antibody complex, right? So that's a typical story where a antigen antibody complex is formed in circulation. And again, the B cells are the producers of this antibody. Now what may happen is that uh, these antigen antibody complexes may get lodged, so they can get deposited wherever, uh, especially they find the receptor for FC portion, okay? Or, what may happen is that if there is an inflammation in particular area and that inflammation leads to vasodilation and then leads to opening up these vascular spaces, the chances are that these antibodies complexes will go 
and move from the circulation into the tissues. Okay? Now, in the third scenario, what happens is that you have an antigen-antibody complex, and then this can invite one of the functions of complement we discussed the other day is that complement can also invite inflammatory cells. So if complement comes in this picture of antigen-antibody complex, then inflammation will come and inflammatory cells will come and then you can see there is going to be inflammation and then again after the inflammation there will be repair by fibrosis. It's just like you got a cut or an injury and whenever there is a repair taking place there's always an element of fibrosis because cells will, it would never be the same. It may become tougher though but it would never be the same. You would always see that kind of a mark there because there's a fibrosis there. Right? So whenever there's an inflammation right because inflammation suggests that uh, there is going to be inflammatory cells. And when healing takes place, uh, always you have to pay the price that uh, there will be fibrosis there. In this case, again, you can see from here, the complex complement comes over here, and then we have a inflammation, which is a complement-mediated inflammation. And again, if you compare type 2 and type 3, you will see type 3 has an inflammatory role as compared to type 2. We did not have inflammation there. Okay. Just one of your colleagues told me that it's bad to have systemic immune complexes because if they are circulating everywhere, uh, they can cause, for example, you must have heard of serum sickness. Serum sickness, when people are getting heterologous, heterologous serum, and then again, uh, that will lead to a disease called serum sickness. And then again, this type of hypersensitivity reaction can also come from infection where you have a infection-associated immune complex disease. Good example is rheumatic fever or strep A or good pastor following viral respiratory infection. So what happens in this case is that uh, if you have strep A infection and you make an antibody for that, so that antibody picks up your heart valves presenting the same epitope that initiated their pro kind of uh, synthesis anyway. So they'll attach over there, so you'll end up with rheumatic fear. And that happens for viral infection as well. Some of the viral infections, you make an antibody to respond to that, and this antibody uh, will pick up the receptor, the epitopes that are similar on lungs and kidneys. So that's what we call post-viral problems. So don't think that some of the diseases you will see happen after you're getting a viral infection because your body is going to recognize uh, these epitopes expressed on this viruses to generate an antibody and this antibody will be picking up across the activity some epitopes presented on your uh, lungs and kidneys and again it will lead to a disease which is type 3 hypersensitivity. Or you can see a localized, mostly, this, mostly type 3 is systemic infection, mostly, that's what the examples are, but it could be localized immune complex disease, a typical example is called Arthas reaction, Arthas reaction. And again, uh, when we talked the other day for both the groups who came for uh, immunology lab test, and remember that I would encourage you to, to know uh, if it comes to the summary for 5, 6, so that summary includes each and every sentence. You have to be very careful. If it's only one page, you really have to understand it well. So if you have to understand what is the principle of ELISA, what is the principle of flow cytometry, what is the principle of radioimmunoassay, what is the principle of a gel, gel electrophoresis. One such thing that I discussed was immunofluorescence. And this is an example of an immunofluorescence. So what is happening is that there is an antigen presented on the basement membrane of a tissue. You can see from that, the tissue over here. And then we attach antibody 
a fluorescent antibody that goes and identify that. And then we look under the microscope. And if the antibodies are specific, so this technique is called immunofluorescence, so it will shine. It will fluoresce. So that's the technique when to identify a fixed antigen on a tissue in tissue biopsies, immunofluorescence. And I also give an example for breast cancer as well. If you have a specific breast cancer, like estrogen receptor 2, and you have an antibody for that, you take the be breast biopsy and attach that to antibody because they're very specific. They will only attach if they find the corresponding antigen over there, which may be a cancer antigen. And you will that see that shining under the microscope. So the whole process basically is called immunofluorescence. Other example for that is, is a, you can see a, again a fluorescent antibody specific for immunoglobulin. It shows you uh, the whole antigen antibody complex being deposited in the kidney and compromising the kidney function and causing inflammation. And you take the biopsy from that side and you pretty much know that uh, it is coming from a antigen antibody complex mediated hypersensitivity type 3 reaction. So you tag your antibody with the fluorescent dye and then you can see we call it lumpy bumpy staining patterns. You can see it's kind of scattered all over depending upon where particular areas uh, these antigen antibody complexes are located. So these are some of the immunoassays. So immunoassays basically uh, have uh, five more extra questions, as you know, that we had uh, taken up uh, the post lab quiz, 10 points added to the final exam tomorrow. So you have five more questions to answer, so you're 55. That's what we agreed upon. So immunoassays, uh, chapter five, as we discussed in the lab, and there was no quiz, are added to the final exam. So you have five extra questions to compensate for 10 points that were scheduled to be given in the lab one. Okay? And you can see a typical case for Arthur's reaction. You can see a local activity over here. If you do biopsy, then you will see typically inflammation, neutrophil inflammation. And that shows you that uh, in biopsies, you can look for the cell. Okay? And uh, let me stop here because I think you got 